Welcome back to Quick Take Stock. I'm Tim Stanovec. I'm Katie Greifeld. Well, let's get right to it. Front Financial co-founder and CEO Stefan Ouellette joins us now. And in May, he told Bloomberg, quote, selling gave way to more selling as investors lured into crypto in search of a quick buck bolted for the exits. The history of these assets has been littered with aggressive rallies and sickening sell-offs. Stefan, thank you for being with us. Do you still see this as a correction or is there more to it now? Well, you know, actually, I, I see it uh, as range-bound trading. This whole uh, thirty to forty thousand uh, dollar Bitcoin price has been a real sickening one for us crypto traders. Uh, you know, I'd like to remind everyone if we were having this interview this time last week, you'd been asking me, "Do I think that the forty one thousand dollar breakout is going to continue?" But now we're back here to, uh, you yeah, know, we're looking at a breakdown of thirty thousand. We're just now rebounding out of it, so I don't know if we've uh, we've seen the direction yet. The futures market is extremely flat. The Bitcoin market just really has no idea where, where it's going right now. I think uh, a lot of mixed signals are confusing traders. What are those mixed signals that are confusing traders? Why does it have no idea where it's going right now? Well, I mean, I think that you've seen a lot of noise come into the space over the last little while that's acting as a catalyst that people are associating with these declines. But, you know, I don't I don't attribute as much of this uh, this move to the rel the catalysts that are being identified. You know, I think that this is this is playing out relatively like a, a regular crypto market cycle. You know, that started with very kind of inauspicious beginnings where people were viewing Bitcoin as an alternative to gold. And then, you know, a year later, we've got you know, DeFi tokens that have existed for only a matter of months with billion dollar valuations. We have NFTs that are, you know, in trading above $50 million that have an artist backing them with no kind of prior history. So, you know, I think that you've got really uh, extreme valuation bloat that is impacting some of the more kind of long-term likely to survive projects like a Bitcoin. And you're seeing a lot of one correlations in this market where everything's getting taken down in spite of the fact that a lot of these, these tokens are very different, you know, likelihoods of survival, different utility use cases right now. So I think you're just seeing a relatively, you know, just chaotic market that, you know, still hasn't figured itself out correcting um, well above le you know levels that if we saw these last year, people would be jumping for joy. So Stefan, first of all, I got to say, I love the Bloomberg terminal in the background. Very nice touch. And I thank you for having me on after everything. <laughs> of course. Well, given that you do have all these competing narratives and all these different inputs, what should be traders focusing on right now? What narrative should they be following? It's a very tough market to trade. I mean, if you if you expected to come back and it come into the crypto market and employ like a long short strategy where you could follow investment narratives a certain amounts of times, like you know, there's a lot of times where where logic is 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 thrown out to the wind in this market. So, I mean, if you're a trader in this market, you know, the market inefficiencies in crypto continue to be you know, unlike any other. There's an extreme amount of retail participation, a lack of institutional investors. So, market inefficiencies we think will continue to persist. For the retail investor, or some, or someone, or you know, someone around around that, on days like today, we, we tell people, you know, we don't speak to retail, we only speak to institutions. But you know, uh, I would say to any crypto trader is, you know, remember why you got in the first place, and if you got in in the first first place for a flippant reason, you know, remember how this feels. But otherwise, if you got into you know asset like Bitcoin because you thought the usage metrics were increasing and this would continue to grow uh, as an important asset globally. I think you're seeing all those metrics. You're continuing to see, uh, you know, continue to see usage metrics increases, wallet balance increases, you know, things that have been increasing kind of like this for the last, you know, 10 decade in the asset while price has been going like this. So if you're looking to decide whether or not this is some asset that you should continue to allocate a small percentage of your portfolio to, uh, you know, I think that the signs are still there. And if you're looking to trade, you know, if you're looking to trade market time, this asset class, it's, it's really good luck. So. To, to that end, Stefan, do, how low does it go right now? I mean, like, you know, at, at this point, I, I do think we're in a range here, right? You know, we're, yeah. we're, we've seen an 8% decline. It's very kind of unsettling to investors that are used to looking at traditional assets because an 8% decline is a big deal, right? You know, if you're trading crypto assets on a regular basis, an 8% decline could be, you know, entering the bottom half of a range. Now, in terms of how low it goes, I mean, if you use March of last year as precedent, it go very, very low. I mean, you know, there is a lot of embedded leverage in the crypto market in general. I mean, it's kind of a longer story, but there, it's, it's, there's outside leverage in the crypto market. There's a lot of unsophisticated investing. So what we saw in March last year is that ultimately we started to hit a level uh, where liquidation started to go off. It was chaos. It was pandemic. No one, no one thought, uh, no one really had an idea what this was going to imply for crypto assets. We saw a decline 
that brought us from you know the range of 10,000 to 3,000 and then back up to 5,000 into 7,000, you know, you know, in the, in the following days. So we could get a really ugly print on Bitcoin if we get like a break of, you know, this, this range that we get, but, you know, I would also, you know, I'd also be very careful to look at prior snap sell-offs where you've gotten this massive liquidation, but the whole thing's been a, you know, a 24, 40 hour round trip back to where we started. So, you know, I don't think that you can like when you're getting to this kind of a level in Bitcoin after this protracted decline, the how low do you go story can get pretty spooky. But, you know, historically, those kind of draw stomach churning levels haven't lasted very long in the space. So, Stefan, let's talk about context here, because if we rewind back to 2017, that was a very painful period. You had that big boom up to what were all time highs. And then Bitcoin really didn't do anything for the next couple of years. And then it had a really painful few weeks, few months in March 2020, especially. How does that moment in time compare to where we are now? How does that feel? How does that feel? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the March 2020 element was, I mean, this feels a lot more like 2017 than March 2020. I mean, March 2020, you know, crypto is reacting to just the chaos that, that came out of you know, the NBA shutdown leading to people realizing we were in a pandemic ultimately. But, uh, you know, um, it feels a lot like 2017. It feels like there's bloated valuations in the sector that need to kind of unwind. I'd argue that in 2017, 2018, there is still isn't really a consensus in terms of what happened there in terms of a catalyst for the decline. It really feels like it was just a market cycle. And I'd argue that that's the case today. I mean, we could talk about, you know, China, we could talk about, you know, you know, a whole bunch of different catalysts that, you know, sure have, most of these have been around the story for a very long time. Incrementally, are they a little negative? Sure. But it really just feels like we're going down because, you know, why did we go up so much in the first place on some of these assets, right? I mean, you've got, you know, a token like Shiba Inu that still has a multi-billion dollar <laughs> valuation has existed for a very short period of time. So, you know, I think that this, it feels like 2017. It feels like a market cycle in the long, long phase of crypto adoption. You mentioned at the beginning of the interview that you're hearing from institutions right now. Can you tell us which institutions you're speaking to about this? I mean, you know, not going to discuss our clients, but I would say that, you know, we speak to a very wide range of institutions. We're an institutional crypto brokerage, okay? The institutional wave of crypto has barely happened at this point. So we're really positioning ourselves for the future. And, you know, and a lot of and a lot of institutions are in that exact same position. They want to position themselves for the future, but they don't really know what that means today. So we speak to you know, you know, tier one financial institutions in, in North America. We speak to similar institutions overseas that are still having trouble finding expertise in terms of how do they fit in this sector. You know, you know, everyone, everyone is curious about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but has very few outlets to go to that uh, they feel are a reliable source. So, uh, you know, you know, people are making decision right now. There's people that are kind of mid project that you know a large financial institution that wanted to dip their toes in. Now this decline, they're not sure. Crypto is still very inconvenient for a lot of the incumbent players. So the reality is a lot of these firms want the space to go away. And so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if on this market decline, we hear about crypto projects mothballed that, you know, people were excited about a couple of weeks ago and, and it, very similar to what we saw in 2017, 2018. Wow. Well, there you have it. Front Financial co-founder and CEO, Stefan Ouellet. Stefan, really great to have you on Quick Take Stock. Really appreciate you. Thanks taking for talking to you. Thanks. It was great. Well, we got much more of the show coming up. Uh, we're going to talk to you in two minutes. You're streaming Quick Take Stock.